This is the booth kitchen with Cooper, Johnny, and outside with Christian and Chris with our second episode of The Joy of Cooking. So today's second episode of The Joy of Cooking, we have a couple special guests and we're going to be making some mushroom stuffing without the bread. We're going to be stuffing it into braised pork, but it's not going to be braised, it's going to be smoked. It's going to be similar. So it's on page 501 and 533 if you're following along at home in your Joy to Cooking books. Here is Chris and Johnny at the smoker. This is Chris Askew. He's a man's man. He likes to cook. He likes long walks on the beach. What's your Instagram handle? Hamish325. Hamish325 on Instagram and number one in your heart. Absolutely. There's a couple of things we like to not cook without, and that would be coffee and beer, especially when you're smoking and cooking with fire. This here is the Dark Knight. The Dark Knight is a smoker. She is a beaut. Has three chambers. We got our fire box. We got our hot smoking box. We got our cold smoking box here. Inside, no comments. Inside, we've got smoke being generated. Look at that. By this cool thing called wood. It's combustible. What kind of wood is that? Well, we are using ourselves a blend of pecan and hickory. Oh. Bought it you can get that to EGB. Pecan we're, or pecan. We're in matter. Georgetown, Texas, by the way. Yes, we are. Uh, this Kingdom is barbecue. This is this is the home of of the Dark Knight and also our chef tonight, Cooper Booth, who is the sous chef at the Hollow Restaurant in Georgetown, Texas. A little shout out to the Hollow. A little shout out to the Hollow. See, we have we have cultured friends. <laughs> yes, culture is Johnny's middle name. Butternut squash is how we're starting off today. Just cubed up. Throw it in a mixing bowl. Throw it in the smoker. Smoke. Equals left. This is Cooper Booth. He is, as we said, an awesome, awesome chef. One of the best in the world, I would say. He's in the kitchen here. What are you doing, Cooper? Um, right now I'm making the, the sauerkraut that's going to go with the pork tonight. It's red cabbage in here. Uh, just start sauteing that down with a little bit of uh, white onion. Um, once that starts to kind of sweat a little bit, you're going to want to hit it with some chicken stock and then Traditionally, you're going to want to put some fennel seeds in here. I didn't happen to have any fennel seeds today, so I have coriander seeds and mustard seeds in there right now. And um, we're just going to let that cook down a little bit, and then we're going to add some vinegar here in a little while. So that's cabbage? Mm -hmm. And Perfect. this is onions? Yep, this is onions right here with shallots and garlic. Um, we're sauteing all this down. This is going to be part of the mushroom stuffing that's going to go inside the pork. So once uh, we sweat these so that they're translucent but not too brown, uh, we're going to add our mushrooms saute those down and then adds a lot of herbage and a lot of love at the end and uh, we'll cool that down and put that inside the pork. There's a lot of action coming up later. Uh, the onions and the garlic and the shallots a little bit. Now we're going to add our mushrooms. These are just cremini mushrooms here, baby portas. Use whatever kind of mushrooms you want. Doesn't really matter? No, it doesn't really matter. Whatever your just preference is, whatever is available. For safety's sake, don't pick them out of your backyard unless yeah. you're a trained mushroom grower. Absolutely. You know what you're doing, then it be delicious. So yeah, we'll just put those in there, and we'll just let those cook down for a little bit longer. And then we're gonna add uh, some herbs. I have some rosemary, some thyme, and some oregano. We're not gonna add all these herbs, but I'm gonna take some of those and dice it up with whatever herbs you want to use. Where'd you get these herbs? Uh, I just bought them at the grocery store. Oh wow, they sell them like that? Yep, grocery store. Yeah, little like one ounce packs of herbs, pretty easy to buy. Awesome. I've never even noticed that. Some mushrooms and garlic and with butternut squash. Why did you put the squash in first? Well, the squash takes longer to cook. It's a lot thicker. It uh, has to go a little bit longer. Well, okay. Chef just made that decision and told me to do it. So I That's very good. Right. Oh yeah, this looks great, Cooper. What are you doing here? Um, this is uh, the cure that I'm building to put on the outside of the pork. And what's a cure? Um, it's a mixture of salt, sugar, it could just be salt or sugar, or you can mix both. This is a mixture here of salt and sugar. It's also um, a healing of an ailment. And a great band from the <laughs> 80s. <laughs> Robert Smith. 
So then, but, uh, so like when you eat ham or something, and like you, that's what cured ham is. It's absolutely. like like a yep. outer layer of like sugary, spicy goodness. Yes, that, sir. that is what it is. Um, so how'd you make this one? This cure is being made right now. It's just is a pretty simple cure. It's called a quick cure or a flash cure. It's gonna have uh, brown sugar, salt, um, probably a touch more sugar than salt. Um, and now, right now, I'm putting in cumin, chili powder, a little bit of chili flakes. I don't really measure anything. Um, yeah, I don't either. I, I can't. And really, everything can't I really put comes out horrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, hopefully, this won't. But, um, no, this will be awesome. I've, I've eaten Cooper's food many times, and it's very good all the time. So then uh, I go pretty heavy with the black pepper every time I cook pork. I kind of like a southwestern profile every time with the pork, and then kind of accompany it with other things. It's pretty heavy on the black pepper. And we're gonna we're gonna grind some coriander seeds. And then it gets a little crazy with the couple coriander of, seeds? Yep, yeah, coriander seeds, stuff that's in uh, you know, uh, if you're gonna have like a blue moon beer or Belgian style beer, oh. it's that that orangey stuff. It kinda smells like fruit loops actually. If you just smell the jar of it, it smells like fruit loops. Can you smell that oh, yeah. It smells like fruit loops. Ooh. It does smell like you, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> I think it kind of smells like me this after is Darby. a she's night a, of she's drinking one of our guests Jager and today. Red Bull. Are you on Instagram? Uh, I'm not. In the spice grinder, and I'm also going to put cardamom pods. Probably about three or four cardamom pods. This is a nice floral um, accompaniment to it. It's used a lot in uh, Middle Eastern and Moroccan cooking. Ah. We're way above our heads here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like a coffee grinder? Yep, just an old school coffee grinder. Um, they actually don't make these ones anymore. I think this one's from the 70s. They don't make things like they used to. <laughs> no, it was a gift, and this one actually works pretty well. Now, if you wanted to get more flavor out of it, if you were going for something that was a little more delicate, where you really wanted to taste the coriander and cardamom, always toast your seeds before you grind them. Oh, toasting holds in the flavor more? Yeah, it, it helps uh, reduce or release all the aromatics that are in the, in the berries themselves. So especially with black pepper, if you're going to grind uh, black pepper, just make sure you toast it first. A little bit more potent. Back to the cure. And then just the best way to get in there is with your hands and mix it up. And then for today we're using a fork loin. Well, that's huge. Not a tenderloin. Um, a little bit less delicate than a tenderloin. It's going to take a lot longer to cook, obviously. And it's more of a roasting cut. This is where your pork chops are going to come from. So this is what's connected to the ribs, and this is what has been cut off. So if we just went down here and sliced this, we'd have little pork chops. Oh, that's awesome. I've never seen it all whole before. What part of the pig is this? The uh, pig were around it. What would it look like? The loin is right here. It's the top of the back. So, oh. with contained within this section of the back is also the tenderloins, which would sit up underneath this. Oh, that's awesome. And the tenderloin is, you know, always the most coveted spot because it's nice and tender, obviously, because it's the reproductive muscle of whatever animal you're eating. Them. That's so, really interesting. Rabbit, rabbit tenderloin, not so much. So, <laughs> we appreciate you getting that tattoo just for our little show here today. <laughs> So these herbs right here, I'm just kind of pulling. Um, I'm just going to give them a quick rough chop before I destroy the rest of the board here. Um, and I'm just going to add these into that cure as well. Is there any chopping technique you use? Um, you only showed us a great chopping technique on last week's episode. Yeah, I, I could probably pull something out. Um, this right here is just a quick rough chop. I'm not going for any, trying to make anything look sexy here. <laughs> oh no, we don't do any of that either. <laughs> 
Alright, so we got some herbage in there. Looking good. Alright. So on your pork, now on a on the if this was a tenderloin, it would just have silver skin on the top. This isn't silver skin. This is fat. You're gonna want to leave that on. So your pork loins are gonna come with fat. Your tender loins are gonna come with just silver skin and a little bit of fat. As you can see here, there's a touch of silver skin underneath here, but that's gonna cook out. It's actually not too bad. So we're just gonna leave that fat on there and we're gonna render it down throughout the cooking process and have all that fat. Okay. So for the cure, the best way to do this is just to get in there and just kind of rub it down. Try to apply it evenly, all sides. You sing to it while massaging it in, it kind of makes it happy. Do you sing? Um, not so much. <laughs> I, I, I mentally sing to the pork mostly. I'm sure he uh, probably hears it just as well. <laughs> you want to come over here and sing to this pork, Christian? <laughs> okay, so we have our cure we can on. Put there. out an album, Songs for Pork. <laughs> have our cure on there. Starting to look pretty. Starting to look pretty here. So now, oh, that's awesome. So now what you're going to do to let the cure apply, you're just going to want to let this sit out at room temperature for about 30 to 40 minutes. And just How are those looking? Oh, these are looking pretty good here. It's uh, some smoked butternut squash, some mushrooms, and just a head of garlic in here. This is just kind of kind of be a little garnish for our pork when we're all done here. Let's check our fire. Fire's looking good. So the smoke from here goes into there and cooks the stuff. Yeah. Is that the yep. idea? Yes. Start the fire down here. It's called the flume box. And then it will move it through. Um, we can dampen the fire. Uh, however much smoke you want to go through. Um, right now I got it kind of wide open so it's nice and hot. And then down here this is the, the cold smoke stack on this particular smoker. Um, if we were going to make sausages or something maybe in a future video if we were going to smoke some fish we'd uh, put it in here and turn it up and uh, the side of the smoker won't really ever get above 200 degrees. So that thing's cooler because it's further down the yep. spiral yep. there. Yep. Cool. All right, so here I have a piece of our uh, smoking wood. Um, what I'm doing right now is I'm basically building a vessel that uh, we can set the pork uh, loin on after it's all ready to put inside the smoker. Um, right here I just have you know some, uh, some green onions. Um, still have a white bulb at the end. I prefer these because at least you know you can still eat the onion at the end. Um, so we're going to start with those. that will kind of give us a base. And then all these all these leftover little herb bits and pieces I have here, thyme, rosemary, oregano, we're just going to kind of put that on there. Um, <clears throat> so once the pork hits the smoker on top of this, it's not going to get a lot of direct heat. You wouldn't want to do this for a long cook over direct heat because all this stuff's going to burn pretty quickly. Now if you were going to do a direct heat method with this, you know, you throw it in the pan or whatever you're cooking right at the end. Um, over the flame and you'll get a really nice effect. This is gonna be more of just kind of a slow effect. I just kind of want the other smoke coming out of the flume box in the smoker to kind of kind of permeate this wood and not really so much catch it on fire or anything like that, but just kind of uh, infuse all the flavors that are coming from this wood plus the, the actual smoke into the pork. Um, wow. We'll see how it goes. I, it could be hit or miss. I haven't tried this in, in this particular smoker at all, so we'll see we'll see how it goes. That's awesome. We're all about experimenting. <laughs> it is 542 right now. We're gonna mess with that port right over there at six o'clock. Right now we're gonna take out this creation that Cooper made. I've never seen anything like this, and he's never done it in this smoker. Uh, oh, I'm halfway done. I gotta run inside real quick. That hurt. <laughs> well, 
Well, we'll keep it rolling. Well, welcome to Texas, folks. <laughs> This is uncut. <laughs> Raw, uncut, and unfiltered. Exactly. We want you to see exactly all the shenanigans that go behind cooking with us. So what we're gonna do, um, we're gonna put this over the direct flame just for a second. I just wanna start the wood kinda getting a little charred up underneath and kinda start everything coming to life a little bit. And then we're gonna move it over into the actual smoke chamber and it can hang out in here next to the butternut squash and the mushrooms. Oh, you're gonna move it over there later. Yeah, I'm gonna move it over here so it won't actually like burn the wood. I just, wanna, I just want to start. So it you can get so it started that... for like the 20 minutes before you put the yep. before you put the pork in the. Yeah, smoker. probably probably not even that whole 20 minutes. We'll probably leave it on here about five six minutes and then move it over. Yeah. This is Darby. She's looking through the Joy of Cooking book. What were you just telling us about the Joy of your experience with the Joy of Cooking book? My grandmother always had it, but I never lo really looked into it. It's kind of cool. <laughs> Chris, have you read The Joy of Cooking? No. Cooper, <laughs> what is your opinion of the on The Joy of Cooking book? Um, I think The Joy of Cooking book is good um, as for a home cook. Uh, it kind of gives you a broad spectrum of American cuisine throughout the last about 150 years. Now there's about eight different renditions of that book to date, I think. Um, so it's kind of elaborated a little farther um, than the Fanny Farmer cookbook, but it's it's right along that style of American cuisine, more down home country style of cooking. Um, it's a great book, also for a reference book because it will go through there and show you different styles of cuts, techniques. Um, it's more of a overall learning book about American cuisine. It won't just hit you in the face with recipes. It'll, it'll set you up for success. So all in all, I think it's a must-have book. It's a great book. How are you uh, cutting these, Cooper? Uh, right here, I'm just doing a, a large dice on these. Um, they're going to go inside the purple cabbage that we've already started cooking down. Um, so they're not really going to hold their form or texture. It's going to be more of a flavor type thing. Um, they will have a little chew. They're going to be more like a baked apple. So if you've had like a an apple crisp or something like that. They're gonna, that's the kind of the texture that we're going for. Nothing really uniform at all in today's cooking, cut-wise. No julienne, no brunoise. You know, not really a whole lot of that going on. This is more of a straightforward type, uh, at your grandma's house, rustic American style of food. That's good because that I think our target audience here is going to be people that don't know that much about cooking. Yeah, and I mean, the, the thing is, is like a lot of professional chefs that, like like myself, that do this for a living, you know, um, this is how we cook at home, you know. Um, so you're seeing inside the life of a professional chef right now. Absolutely. Yeah, this, is, this is what I like to eat. It's got a lot of German influence in this. You know, I came from a German family, so. It's kind this is the kind of stuff you ate growing up? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Uh, definitely, definitely around uh, where I was from. You know, in my family, not so much. Um, my mother didn't really care for pork all that much, so we had we had a lot of beef. Uh, my dad and I, we would always do the pork. Um, oh, cool. But uh, beef and chicken. But you know, coming from the Midwest, you know, the farmland, Iowa, Wisconsin, there's a lot of German heritage, a lot of uh, Norwegian, Swedish heritage, uh, Scandinavian. So a lot of my style of cooking will, you know, reference those points of Scandinavian style. Of cooking. How's this looking? This is good. I'm just letting this cool down. This is just our duck cell. Um, I just turn it every once in a while to make sure none of the mushrooms are kind of sticking to the pan or anything like that. Cabbage is rolling pretty good. We just added the apples. Um, Did you turn the heat up or do anything? No, I didn't turn the heat up or anything yet. Is this that fancy I'm, French kind of um, just gonna, cookware? Yeah, this is, you know, it's a Dutch oven. Um, it's what? not this this particular Dutch oven isn't Le Creuset or anything like oh, that. Okay. But this is a That's very. That's what we're used to using. Yeah. This this, <laughs> this is a this is a very solid Dutch oven right That's here. Awesome. Um, I think this one we picked up for less than a hundred dollars, so they're obtainable. They're not. It's, it's some of some expensive. of just one thing like that is more than a hundred dollars. Yeah, most of the Le Creuset stuff like this for a crock pot this size, if it was Le Creuset and it was all cast iron, would run you five six hundred bucks. That's a lot of money. That's like, it's a couple symbols right there. All this, I'll reserve this. Um, 
use it for something else, tea or a dessert or something that, like that. that over there? Yeah. Ginger? But, yep, this is ginger root. You know, you can get it at most grocery stores across the country. You could also use ginger powder. So you're just thinking like the core of it and yep. using it? Yeah, you basically just want to peel back the skin off the ginger, just like a potato or something. I'm kind of doing it rough. Um, if you have a uniform piece of ginger, you can uh, you can use a peeler on it, a regular potato peeler, a vegetable peeler. I always use a knife. You can uh, cut off all the fingers and appendages of it and put it there? Yeah, I mean, th this stuff just makes it, like, this is all usable ginger in here, but just to get an easier piece to work with oh, okay. for what I'm doing, I just went for the biggest yeah. spot because it's easier to clean up faster. So this ginger, we're just gonna we're gonna dice this up pretty fine. It's called a brunoise. Anything that's an eighth of an inch and under. Um, so the easiest way to start a brunoise would be to cut yourself strips like that, and then you're basically just gonna julienne like so, and then kind of reform it. Ginger's a little tricky because it won't won't stick quite as nicely as most fruit will. Um, obviously not a fruit; it's a root. So kind of match stick it like this, move it back, line it up, and then you're just going to do the same thing that you just did on the other side until you're left with a little little cube under, underneath what's, the nape. What's that called again? You're saying some fancy word like yeah. Juliet or something? Yeah, it's called a brunoise. Yeah. Brunoise. Anytime it's real small like that. It's but uh, what's, your cook, what's your slicing style? Um, you said something like Juliet. Yeah, yeah, if I, if I was going to cut this into a julienne, which you have to uh, to start, this would be a julienne, where it's just in thin strips. Oh, that's just what it means, is thin strips? Yep. Okay. So that would be a julienne, and then by the time we break it down, we're left and you with just, a... You just kind of do it like front to back, and then you push the push it through mm -hmm. as you... Yeah, and I mean, everybody has their own style for using a knife, you know, whatever makes, you know, feels comfortable. Um, Obviously, you know, if you can't go that fast or don't want to go that fast, don't take your time. Yeah, you don't want to lose a finger. That doesn't taste very good in the, in this particular recipe. So some people like to drink alcoholic beverages while they eat dinner. Tell us about this, Johnny. We're, we're about gonna, these people. We're going to go with uh, an old-fashioned... Uh, it's going to be a little bit modified from what the book says, but using the main ingredients, you can use uh, bourbon or whiskey. Uh, Bullet is a really nice, nice bourbon. And, uh, and that's the small size. That is the small <laughs> size. Dar the size of a human head, I believe, is what they Texas. asked for. Dar Darby actually came up with the idea to make some old fashions. Uh, so they got, uh, what was it, orange bitters? Mm -hmm. um, Maraschino cherries. She's the band of white on this show. Now she has to come on the road to do this every week. <laughs> or however often we do this. You do this. Oh, oh look at that. And Once you buy a prize, it's yours to keep. We were we didn't find oranges at the store, but we did uh, see some leftover uh, halos. So we're gonna use those. Those are a little soft, I felt them so we, it should, well, it's got enough juice. It should oh, be you got them cut it up. It produces already. what we need. Awesome. Look we at garnish that. Garnish it with it. And it's on page fifty nine, your handy dandy. Joy of cooking. Make sure you always Cookbook. drink adult beverages, as Todd would say, in in moderation. Yes. That Just whole, like him that, and her. It, like too. <laughs> everyone here could probably drink just one of these tonight, and that's moderate. Very moderate. Toned down. Yeah, one huge thing of whiskey is more than enough. Things in this video may say. be bigger than they see. And there's some beer salt. And Cooper's awesome knife. Check this out. That's beautiful. I don't know the story behind this. I might try to get him and tell it if I remember. But look at that sucker. That's amazing. Look at that sucker. Oh, Old fashioned. This is Chris Askew. My name's Chris. I'm a bartender. Where do you work, Chris? I work at Highlights Game Town Grill. Game Time Grill down in uh, Four Points. By the lake in, in Georgetown, Austin. Texas. In Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. Old Fashioned is a fantastic old school cocktail. They went out of style, but now they're coming back. 
Orange. So they're about to be called the hipster <laughs> fashion or something. Maraschino cherry. Generally, you'd use some simple syrup, but I don't have any right now. So just using a little Look bit of Look at that, juice. what he does on the fly. This is brilliant. If you don't have a muddler, you can use a spoon. Like I'm Again on the fly. That is quite the subtle muddle. It's a very subtle muddle. Ice. I'm using Bitters. some advanced video taking techniques here, by the way. I'm zooming in, I'm zooming out, focusing on things. I just want to do my own home horn for just. You know. just wonder, We're using some orange bitters here today instead of some uh, Angostura bitters. What kind orange. of bitters? Angostura. What are those? Just the normal bitters that you usually get. I like to have a shot of bitters sometimes. Bullet whiskey. I believe they get the name from uh, Augusta, Georgia, where Augusta bitters came from. <laughs> That has nothing to do with it at all. <laughs> I'm glad you're here to keep it straight on this one. Yeah, every other video is going to be full of false information. <laughs> Give it a little mix, a little stir, and you have yourself a taster. Let Vanna taste it. You can tell us if it's terrible. It's a little sweet for me, but I like mine really strong. Well, there's one way to fix that problem. <laughs> da -da. On the fly, look at him. Wow. Do you have a bartender like that? I don't think so. Come to Austin. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're about to uh, open up our uh, tender or our pork loin here, and uh, we're gonna butterfly this, and we're gonna stuff our mushroom uh, stuffing on the inside. Um, this loin's a little bigger than I anticipated when I bought it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and hack off the end right here. Um, if you have a big party or something else going on, uh, go ahead and do the whole thing. But for cooking purposes today, I'm just going to reserve that and we'll roast that up at a different date and we'll just slice it up. So, for this pork loin, I don't know, Todd, if you can get a picture of that yeah. on, down here on this end, right here. Sure. Just, the, just that. You can see that the cure has already started to set the color of the pork a little bit more. Most of the pork that you buy at the grocery store, if it's not organic or not from the farm that you know, is not going to be that red. So from just the hour or so that we've had the cure on there, it's already started to set the color of the pork. That's amazing. Okay. So then bear with me if I get a little quiet here for a second. But to butterfly this guy, basically what we're going to do, and I'm going to do it from this back side because that's easier for me because I'm right-handed. Um, we're going to find a point basically right in the half. You know, we're going to start a slit we're going to cut this guy in half and then we're just slowly going to work our knife to basically open this guy up like a book. You're always going to want to use a sharp knife to do this so that you don't uh, molest the meat in any way and kind of break it up and ruin all that muscle structure that's going on in there. So See you, how adults uh, can say words like that, Johnny? Yeah, that I, that was tough not to call me. <laughs> what you just said. We're children. We're like we have some budget at the grocery store at the last <laughs> last thing. What were we going to say though? You had important stuff to say in that story. Uh, no, not really. We're right, just... right after you said molest the meat. <laughs> <laughs> we just kind of remember that. Kind of keep going back through here, trying to keep it as even as you can. We basically want this guy to open up like a book. Now, this technique that I'm using, I usually use on pork bellies, which will roll a little bit better. Uh, for the sheer fact of this, this is going to be more like a stuffed fish as opposed to a traditional roulade as it's called or a, a round. You have a lot of fancy words. <laughs> we need to like define all these words for, on the comment section or something. Okay. So we have it here and we have it pretty much opened up like a book. About as far as we're going to go. Now obviously with a pork loin one end is going to be thicker than the other end. So. When you get kind of into this thick stuff 
like so. This is where I don't have a meat hammer here with me. I have them all at the restaurant. But what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of get in here. I saw a regular hammer outside. Would that help? Uh, no, not so much. We use that hammer in our smoker. I don't really want to go through the process of cleaning it. So I have clean hands. Don't be afraid of hands. All good food is made with hands in food. Oh, that's good advice. That's from a pro right there. I hope everybody noticed the, all the attention to detail. That detail, that detail, the wood on the smoker, the little concoction he made on the other piece of wood on the smoker. That's what makes Cooper Booth the Peyton Manning of chefs, as we like to call him. As USA Today <laughs> is about to call him. Okay, so now that we have the meat kind of exposed here, um, you always want to season any meat, even though what we already what we have going on the inside is already seasoned. Don't be afraid to wipe your hands either. To get it <laughs> greasy. <laughs> um, when I season meat, always black pepper first, and then salt. Especially if you're gonna sear, if you're gonna cook like a ribeye in a pan at home or something like that, you always wanna put your pepper down first to build a crust. Here's the leftovers from the old fashioned. I just have to note that the old fashioned was my grandfather, Emil Silao's favorite drink. He used to make them all the time. We got our butterfly uh, pork loin here, seasoned up, salt and pepper, just a little bit on the inside. Now we're gonna take our mushroom mix, stuffing, duck cell if you're French. This is similar to what we did on the first video with the cordon bleu, right? Like you cut yeah, it open it's, like it, that? Yeah, it's kind of the same technique. You probably could have used a similar technique with cutting it from the back side and all that with a sharp knife. <laughs> we kind of didn't do that. So that's good. Like we're learning something here. So what you're going to want to do is you're just going to kind of want to put your mushrooms in there and get it all kind of flat, situated a little bit. Pork um, is bad for you as chicken as far as washing your hands? No, it's not. Um, the only disease with pork, I mean, always be careful with any undercooked meat. Um, that fallacy that you can't eat pork that is cooked medium rare is completely untrue. Um, it used to be true 100 years ago um, when trigonosis was still prevalent in pigs, uh, but trigonosis has been bred out of pigs, so no fear on undercooked pork. Enjoy it, love it. Good advice right there. Okay, so we Donnie have, and I are here learning all of this stuff this, this is, from uh, the master. I'm, I'm excited about all these things he's teaching us. Okay, so we're just going to put a couple onions in there on the inside too, just some more aromatic development. Um, just kind of building some flavor. So now when it comes time to fold this guy back up, <clears throat> what we're going to do is, is you're going you're gonna to roll it up. You're gonna roll it, you know, you kind of want it to be like a sausage. We're making a big meat sausage. For all you basically. sausage makers out there, this will be very familiar to you. I'm just stirring this for you. That's yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you. So any of the stuff that kind of comes out the end, you just kind of want to pick it up, push it back in there a little bit. Like when you squeeze the hot dog bun and the ketchup squirts out on your pants. <laughs> At the baseball game, that's super annoying. Okay. All right. Break. Okay, over here I'm uh, lining out our bacon. This is just regular store-bought bacon. You know, if you go through all the trouble to make your own, that's always better. But, How do you make your own bacon? Um, you just take a pork belly and apply that same kind of cure technique for a longer period of time that I just uh, showed you earlier. Wow. And then, you know, throw it in the smoker, and once it comes out smoked, but not completely, you know, you're not cooking it per se. You're just imparting flavor once it hits the smoker. But that's your bacon. You let that cool, slice it super thin, and fry it. And that's awesome. 
Where did you learn all this? Uh, well, I, you know, I went to culinary school. I've also been working in professional kitchens for 14 years, going on 15. What culinary school did you go to? I went to August Escoffier uh, School of Culinary Arts in Austin, Texas. Oh, you went here? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, it was uh, more of a more of a recent gig. Um, you know, most of most you cooked for a long time before you yeah. went. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, mostly everything I know is. Do you recommend that, or do you recommend going like, um, right away if you're young and interested in cooking? If you're inspired, but I always recommend um, you're going to get more of an education from working in the industry than you are from going to school. Um, I did it to kind of further myself and you know um, get that piece of paper that's. Uh, did that help you? Um, it it has helped. It helped provide a little bit more confidence than I had before. Um, Does a piece of paper things. help? What's up? Does a piece of paper help that yeah, says I mean, you graduated? Yeah, I mean, it can always help. It, it all depends on what kind of avenue or field you really want to get into. I guess it can't hurt, and it can kind of help verify things you're already learning and, like, give you new ideas. Yeah, absolutely. With the, the experience is, is by far, you know, it's like anyone reads a book, but until you actually put it into application and are in the kitchen doing it, you learn so much more yep. by... Trial and, and, error. and you know, every, everybody that you work for is going to have different techniques and different ways that they like to see things. So you're going to learn so. different ideas on what you can make your own. The more experience, the better. Is it is it a rule um, in cooking, Cooper, that if you wrap anything in bacon, it makes it way better? No. Um, is that no, a rule? Not no. really, but I mean, at that point, you're not tasting whatever you're wrapping in bacon. You're tasting bacon, and we all know that bacon is one of those undeniable So you can flavors. be a terrible cook and just wrap whatever you do in bacon, and you're solid. Yeah, as long as you make it taste like bacon. That's not really the purpose here. No, this is somebody that knows how what they're doing. <laughs> and see, even a professional chef has difficulty, so if you get discouraged, don't. Well, this would really help with butcher's twine. Um, yeah, we kind of did this on the fly today. We're all out of butcher's twine. <laughs> don't, don't have any butcher's twine. Twine, so. twine. that's hard to say. So butcher's if, twine. If I had if I had some twine, I would have trust this guy all up. So that How many old fashions is that? <laughs> he'd be nice and tight. but toy, Like a toyga. Neither here nor there. It's still going to be delicious for this kind of preparation. But yeah, butcher's and you don't have to eat, eat the string. Make that no, you just cut it off at the end. Oh, you cut it off at the end. <laughs> Wash your hands again, even though there's no salmonella. Trichinosis. It's been bred out of pigs. See what we learned today? Look at him go. Stirring the cherry onions. So here we're making like a, a cherry chutney. It's got cherries, gingers, uh, ginger, and uh, onions in it. Um, just Reducing that with a little bit of chicken stock, and then here in a minute we're going to add some brown. What does it mean to reduce? I hear people brown say brown sugar. Uh, just let the liquid level cook down, and it'll. Uh, so it'll, as it cooks, it like cooks this stuff, the liquid yeah, all, into all, the stuff, and that's the, called reducing it. Yeah, well, I mean, just reducing the liquid level. What happens through reduction is, is all the sugar is going to cook out of the cherries, and it's going to create like a syrup. Oh, okay. That's all. Awesome. That would be the chutney part of it. I always yeah, hear so people say that, and I never know what they mean. We'll reduce this and blah blah blah. And I, what do we have here? Here we have uh, some carrots that I've been roasting in coffee, uh, just to kind of infuse that coffee flavor. And these will just be served as an accompaniment on the plate. But they're not quite ready yet. But see attention to detail, Peyton Manning, or maybe the Brett Favre of, as Cooper would like, the Brett Favre of cooking or who's your favorite quarterback uh, he's playing right now Aaron Rodgers yeah. Aaron Rodgers Aaron Rodgers of cooking we're gonna get him business cards or a t-shirt or something what what does your cooking style have in common with Aaron Rodgers quarterbacking style um, arrogance I, I cook French <laughs> <laughs> that is true arrogance is is a commonality but you both can you both can uh, back up your arrogance for sure. So maybe we'll call it just confidence. 
as you're as you're doing this dough, are, would you feel as confident in your cooking, grilling, smoking abilities as you would your baking? Uh, not when it comes to particular things like baking a simple loaf of bread like this. Uh, Wait, you're making bread, dude? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, grilling, grilling. I'm more than confident on the smoker. That's kind of a new avenue for me. Um, so no, what I'm, did you I'm do to make Texas. this bread so far? Uh, I started with three cups of uh, room temperature water, added about two tablespoons of yeast, a couple tablespoons of salt, um, let that kind of do its thing, uh, proof the yeast, and then I How just, do you proof yeast? Um, you just mix it with salt and warm water, and the salt is what feeds the yeast, and as long as it foams and does its thing after about five minutes, you have good yeast. So you let it sit like five minutes? Yeah. This is so educational. Not just for me and Johnny, but for Darby and Chris as well, and the American public. All 8,000 of our YouTube subscribers. That's Pam. Yeah, just some cooking spray or some oil or semolina flour would be preferable or cornmeal. Is that a, a pizza stone? Yeah, this is just a pizza stone. I use this to bake on. Um, it works decently well. So yeah, that's just a straight white bread country loaf or asian as it would be called in French. Uh, do you, we're just going to let that proof up a bit. Uh, no, I'm not going to do anything to this. I'm going to cut it after it proofs a little bit. When Johnny and I go on the road as a hip hop duo, we go by country loaf and white bread, so that's <laughs> it, very appropriate. All right, we're gonna go out to the smoker. Here we go, moving the pork. What's the temp on that? Two seventy five. And this time we come around the corner and there's nobody using the restroom over here. It's quite a pleasant surprise. Okay, so the chamber of the smoker right now is at about 275 degrees. So for this guy to be in here at 275 would take, you know, anywhere from four to five hours to cook all the way through. Um, well, we're, we're hungry. Yeah, what we're going to do with it is is we're going to use this as more of a vessel to impart a lot of that smokiness flavor, and then we're going to finish it at the oven at the very end. So you could just smoke it all the way. Yeah, it's just going to take, take like all day. It's going to take some time, and you're going to have to feed your fire. Um, so it'd be good to do all this before the football game, and then oh yeah, absolutely do watch this. the games while. You're setting it right on there, huh? Yeah. I'm going to set it right on this log that we toasted up that has all those aromatics underneath it. So you picked a log that was flat. Yeah, I picked a log that was flat to basically make a plate, kind of like a vessel for it to sit on or a tray or something like that. Let's put some of those goodies back in there. But yeah, we're not going to finish the cooking process out here. We're just going to start getting some flavor on it now. So just let the smoke kind of do its thing. It's probably going to chill out in here for about an hour. And then we'll throw it in the oven. The veggies are still doing good. And then we'll throw it in the oven and uh, then we'll finish it up. So while everyone's outside, Darby is here to show us her way of making an old fashioned. Now what what's your bartending experience, Darby? Uh, none, really. See? So at home you can do this too. Yes. So the trick to an old fashioned is to not have really any simple syrup or anything, but the sugar cube, but we don't have a sugar cube. So you gotta put like a half a tablespoon, not even, of sugar directly into the glass. And then you get your maraschino cherry. Mm. One, maybe two, just for good luck. Two is good luck because of next to the tracks. So exactly. we like to use. We like to use the number two. And then you're going to have an orange that has more rind than it does body on it. Oh, you why squeeze, is that? You squeeze that in there because you rub the rest of it on the rim. Oh, that's super fancy. And then you put that in there and then you use a pretty decent size. 
put this one in the hat. Orange. So since you've got the sugar in there already, you're going to muddle this a little bit before you put the bitters in. Which means just mash it up, right? Yeah, you just mash it all up together. Because you want the juices to release into that sugar and make it syrupy. So that's like an old-fashioned way of making simple syrup. Right. Well, simple syrup technically is just water and sugar. Sugar boiled up and made it syrup. That's why it's so simple. Reduce, like you learned earlier. Oh Learn yeah. This beautiful man. Look at him. So you mix that up, muddle it pretty good. You got juices in there. You can't really feel the grittiness of the sugar. Put your bitters. Like seven, maybe seven shakes of a lamb's tail, as the old yeah. saying goes. I don't like a lot of bitters, but we're gonna make this normally. And then your ice. This is vanilla ice, I believe. Ice, ice. That. Which means we stole this ice from the band Queen. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't feel sorry about it. Oh one. no. And then you want your whiskey or your bourbon to cover the ice maybe a little bit more for good touch that's a lot of bourbon right there yeah whoever gets this drink is going to yeah, taste the bourbon <laughs> texas a&m university a little shout hey. out Whoop. sorry there you go and then you put a little bit of the garnish on there that's what you do see and this is from an amateur and look how awesome she did there we go. Viola. So we were talking about this knife earlier, and now Cooper's here to explain it to us with that awesome sheath. Um, he was wearing this the other day, and I was like, dude. Yeah, awesome. so I, I use this at the restaurant quite a bit. It's kind of one of my go-to knives. Um, this is a 8-inch, uh, it's called a Gyoto knife. It's a Japanese-style blade. Um, it's made out of Damascus steel. Um, this is a buffalo horn handle for this particular knife. Um, this was all handmade for me in, uh, by a guy <laughs> named Bugsy in England. Um, actually, just got shipped over here a couple weeks ago from England. Um, made the sheath, too. It's That's like awesome, man. Com complete one-off knife. Nobody else has one of these knives. Um, I like it. It's a pretty knife. It's kind of heavy. Um, so you kind of got to know what you're doing or be used to handling a knife to, to deal with it. But... Uh, yeah, her name is Tatanka. <laughs> awesome. Because of because of the buffalo horn handle. Oh, so, nice. I love buffalo. So, yeah, that's that's one of my babies. One Very my babies. cool. <laughs> Ready, dog? Yeah. Um, Look at this. This is the smoked product. So this is the the pork loin that we just took off the smoker right here. Um, Wrapped in bacon, some of it fell off a little bit. Not really gonna matter. There's only six of us eating tonight, so we're gonna take this half of it here. But uh, it was on there for about 45 minutes at about 200 degrees. Um, hopefully it'll be delicious. We'll let you know in a minute. So it's about time to finish this meal up. Look at this pork. Look at that cabbage. Cherry chutney to go on top of the pork. And then watch this. This is a Cooper. preface to what's going to happen in several months. Look, it looks pretty similar to this, doesn't it? Five months. <laughs> Take the butt out of the oven. <laughs> With a great, awesome t-shirt. <laughs> this is going to win the Tony, I believe. What's your strategy for cutting this pork? Um, just kind of let it cool a little bit after you take it off of the, the smoker, or the oven, or the fire, wherever it's coming from. Let it rest. You always want to let your meat rest, whether it be beef, pork, chicken, anything. That's what leads to the bleeding out of juices that will make it look like you just killed the animal and put it on a plate. So the first couple of slices coming out of this guy are going to be... They're going to be a little less full, obviously, because it's such a big, 
big uh, pork loin. I didn't have that in mind really when I bought it. I didn't know how big it was. Um, so once we get into the middle here, it should be nice and full on whatever slices we have coming out. It's, it smells great. Uh, that, that was uh, chef speak for I think it turned out pretty well. Awesome. <laughs> Let's give to Cooper. Sure, to Cooper. To Cooper. Cooper. So what I'm doing now is I'm just kind of reserving some of the mushrooms that came out of the inside of the stuffing on these uh, pre-sliced ones here. And I'll just add those back to the plate when I plate it up. Um, kind of give people that effect. This guy, I'm just gonna put back up here. This is all the pork that we didn't slice. I'm gonna kind of restuff a little bit of those mushrooms in there. Obviously, if you had butcher's twine, which is properly the technique that should have been used here. Um, my bad servants that went to the grocery store for me um, forgot the butcher's <laughs> twine. So, uh, we're stuck with this right here. But um, obviously- That you, might or might not have been there. It was uh, the bartenders. <laughs> they were probably drunk. <laughs> they hooked it up in other ways. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to let this rest one more minute, and then um, I'm basically just waiting for this bread to get done here, and then we'll slice the bread. And How do you know when that's done? Put it up. Um, bread comes out when it's done, you know, it'll sound hollow, kind of be like a drum. Which is ironic because that's the restaurant that Cooper is the sous chef, sous -chef at, the hollow. See what see and what happened there? I'm a drummer, so it's even better. This is a mash made in heaven. So, but you always want to let your fresh bread, once it comes out of the oven, you always want to let it sit for about 10 to 15 minutes and cool down before you cut it. If you uh, cut it right away as soon as it comes out of the oven, the bread will deflate and it won't continue to cook. Uh, you want it to continue to cook, to, uh, once again, not uh, disrupt the gluten structure of the bread. And it will also, you know, get you that nice, holy, airy type of bread that we're looking for, especially with a country ancien loaf or country bread um, that we have here. Now, though, let me ask you a quick question about uh, things that, is it an old wives' tale, or what's the rule with when you Dude, they don't chicken prefer the term the old and chicken wives. out of the uh, oven or pork? Uh, how long doesn't it cook? Continue to cook after you put yeah, it on I mean, the burner. Yeah, I mean, anything that's hot, as soon as you put it anywhere else, is going to continue to cook. It's called carryover cooking. Um, the more you cook, the more you'll be in tune with carryover cooking and how long things take to rest and uh, what temperatures they'll reach for how long that they've rested and uh, things of that nature. You know, it's it's more of a feel thing. You know, even having a college degree in cooking and doing all that, you know, you're not really ever going to be able to tell how long something is going to carry over cook until you've made it three, four, five, all the way up to a hundred times. So, good to know. Good to know. Hello. My name's Chris. I'm your bartender tonight. I got a recipe from a very great regular of mine who happens to know how to make the proper old fashioned. Here goes. Orange rind. Slap it. Slap it like you mean it. <laughs> you want to break and open the zest on the orange rind there. At this opportunity, you rim your glass. Dude, dude, wait, 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 wait. Goes in the glass. Half a teaspoon of orange, of sugar. <laughs> Crystallization of the sugar will help with the muddling process and release the flavors. There's the cherry. Halved. Two. One. Halved. Which makes next okay. to the trap. Before you muddle. Before we muddle. Send Look at that advice. I know you are. In our case, orange bitters tonight. Usually bitters of Angostura. Before we muddle, just throw a chunk of orange in there. He's working on being the Peyton Manning of bartenders. I mean. No, seriously. Except, I'm kind of coachable because I'm being coached from the sideline. <laughs> okay, I so gotta that ask makes you. me more like Tom Brady. We gotta okay. Tom Brady is only coachable. We gotta so interview. We are really muddling quick. orange, cherry, sugar, bitters and together. I can't fill the sugar anymore. Ooh. Focus. Yeah. About sports. 
Focus. Look at that. My sugar has been properly dissolved. Bartenders also usually wash their hands before they handle your drink. And whatever doesn't get off, the alcohol will kill. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. You will then cover this beautiful mixture with ice. The focus. Oh my god. As much what ice. Look at this tasting. Oh my god, it's delicious. Okay. It's so delicious. You want some? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Dude, he's Mr. Manning and bartender. Maybe, maybe, pick and study. maybe we could call the Andrew Luck of bartender. No. No. Take a sip. Taste your own wares. Delicious. Fine. Weakens my will to leave And I know when I meet winter's cold I'll miss your warmth and ease But danger